Good to see you guys. All right, have a seat, and welcome to Fourth of July weekend, Independence Day. It's really good to see you. I want to say hi to all of our campuses, all 15 campuses, particularly our overseas campuses, Manila, Hong Kong, Buenos Aires, Berlin. We love you guys. You look great. You look great. I hope you have a great barbecue this weekend sometime. Save a little doggy bag, send it to me, Rick Warren. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, it's really good to see you. I've missed you. Have you missed me? Yeah. Come on, I, I miss you. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna just praise you first off for being consistent at worship. In the middle of summer, while I've been out doing other things, you know, preaching and teaching and training and things like that. You know, a lot of churches, uh, if the senior pastor goes, like attendance just collapses and there's nobody there, uh, particularly uh, if the pastor is gone. But that just doesn't happen at our church and doesn't happen for two reasons. And I praise you for this. Number one, you're committed to Jesus, not to me. And that's what it's all about. And he's gonna be here no matter who's teaching. This is a purpose-driven church, not a personality-driven church. That's a big deal. And it's a big, really important uh, to us. Second thing is, we have what we call deep bench strength in teachers. And I mean, I wanna thank uh, Pastor Tom, Tommy Hilliker, Pastor Tom Kang, and Pastor uh, Buddy Owens for three incredible, outstanding messages uh, the last three weeks. I mean, those were knock it out of the park, home run messages. I was taking notes. I was watching, no matter where I was around in the world, I was taking notes on them, and those guys were just, you know, we have about half a dozen really good Bible teachers in this church, so um, actually I believe it's important for you to hear God's word from more than one personality. I think it's good for your spiritual health that you don't get all of your truth from just one guy. And that's why sometimes when I'm even in town, I just have somebody else teach because I feel it's important for you to hear God's word from a lot of different people. And I wanna tell you about my tour of Saddleback campuses in Asia, uh, just real quick. Last Saturday, I was at Saddleback Manila. Now, because I couldn't be in every church on Sunday, they held church on Saturday because I was gonna be there. And even though it was on Saturday, we had a 1,000 people show up at Saddleback Manila. And it was a great, great service. Hello, Manila. And uh, we bab I baptized that day 61 new believers in Manila. So that church is just exploding. It was really, really great. Uh, nearly 1,000 people and 61 baptized. Then I got on a plane and went to Saddleback Hong Kong. And on, last Sunday, we had 2,300 at Saddleback Hong Kong. Okay. Now, let me just put that in perspective. That's bigger than 95% of all the churches in America. That's what's called the mega church. And I baptized 53 people there. And so it was a great, great day. They love you, they thank you, they appreciate all of the Decade of Destiny gifts that helped start those two churches. And it was just really tender to hear uh, one story, one story after another. And we had some testimonies. Got up. I, one, my favorite story was a woman who came up and said, I've never been a Christian, I never heard about God, I didn't go to church, but I was invited a friend to Saddleback, Hong Kong, and I went and I watched a fat man on a flat screen. <laughs> I thought that was great. And she goes, but he made sense. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And now she's involved in service there, just really a young professional woman in Hong Kong. And uh, that was really a big deal. Uh, this weekend and after that, I was at, in Australia, in Sydney, at, Hong, at, at the Hillsong Conference, which is a big annual conference uh, for all of Australia. And actually a lot of people from around the world come in. There were 20,000 people there. And I delivered a message on how to hear the voice of God. And I thought the message was so important that I want you to hear it. So I asked them for a video. And so they gave me a video of myself. <laughs> because I really wanted you to hear this message this weekend on how do you hear the voice of God, and we're gonna share that uh, in, in just a minute. I wanted to give you also a little update. Uh, I wanted to wait a month before I gave you the final report on uh, daring faith commitments, because I knew more would come in in the next month, and of course they did, and in the last month, 10 million more dollars was committed. So, in one month, so we're now, friends, over 80 million dollars. Okay, that's a world record. Okay, 
that, that is a world record. And, and what's cool about that commitment is that since the offering in the first month, 10% of that has been given in one month. So that's eight and a half million dollars came in to do all of those big five faith goals we were talking about earlier today. You're just incredible. There's no church like Saddleback. There's no more generous church. Um, and if you weren't a part of that, it's still plenty of time to join us. If you haven't started tithing, just try that. But it, I was just so proud of you that uh, in the first month, 10% of the offering came in, which is amazing. And I would ask you and encourage you to whatever you committed to give. And you know, like I said, it wasn't any like anybody giving giant amounts. It's everybody bringing their loaves and fishes. Everybody doing what they could do. My little part, your little part, and all our little parts put together just added up uh, in the sacrifice and faith. And I would try to, I would set a goal. It's a three-year commitment. Try to give half of your commitment in the first year. I would try to do that. And then a quarter and a quarter for the next two years. Now, it's 4th of July, and I want us to just pause for a minute and pray for our nation. Do you think our nation needs prayer? Let's bow for prayer. Father, we, we thank you for our nation. It's got a lot of problems, it's got a lot of hang-ups, it's got a lot of faults, but it's still an incredible country. And no nation has ever been as generous with the rest of the world. No nation has fought for the freedom of other people like America. No nation has given foreign aid. No nation has served the sick and the poor and the refugees and defended the defenseless like this nation. So in spite of all of the problems and all of the weaknesses and all of the uh, sad things that happen in our culture, we thank you that we live in a place where we're free to worship. We pray for our leaders those we agree with and those we disagree with. You've told us to pray for all of them. And we pray for your blessing. You've said in the book of Timothy that when you pray for the leaders of, of, of the nation that it brings blessing upon you. So we do that today. We know that freedom is not free. That somebody paid for it with their life. And we honor those and we pledge ourselves to be people of freedom, not just political and social freedom, but to lead people to spiritual freedom in you, Jesus Christ. And we pray this and ask you to bless America in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's watch this. The most important factor in your future is not your background. It's not your race. It's not your education. It's not the opinions of other people or what your parents told you. The most important factor in your future is hearing from God. What does God say about your life? Now the theme of this conference, Hillsong 15, is speak, Lord. We're listening. So last night I just sat down and wrote out a few thoughts and I want to talk to you this morning, and I actually want to invite Pastor Brian about halfway through this message to come up and share as we talk about hearing the voice of God. Nothing is more important in your life than you learning how to hear the voice of God and distinguish it from Satan's voice, other people's voice, and your own voice. Nothing is more important than that. So it's a great theme. Now the Bible is full of examples of God speaking to people over and over and over and over. So what's the problem today? Does God have laryngitis? Has he got a sore throat? Why can't you hear God speak to you on a regular basis? And the answer is because we're not tuned in. We're not tuned in. What I want to do in this time this morning is a couple things. Quickly just share the best example I know in scripture of how to hear the voice of God through Moses. And then I want to invite Pastor Brian up, and I told him we were gonna, I was going to do this. And I want to just discuss with him, how do you test an impression? Because a lot of you can't figure it out. Now the longer you walk with the Lord, I've walked with Jesus Christ for over 50 years. 
I know the voice of Jesus Christ. I know when he speaks to me. There's no doubt in my mind. And the Bible says that hearing God's voice and being able to distinguish it is important for three reasons. First, it proves you are a child of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. The Bible tells us in the, in the book of John, chapter eight, verse 47, he who belongs to God hears God's voice. And he who does not belong to God does not hear it. Not only that, it protects you from mistakes. Job 33 talks about that. And not only that, it is the key to a productive life. Anything I have been able to accomplish in my life is by the grace of God and because I was able to discern what God was saying in that moment. Nothing is more important than you to be able to say, speak Lord, I'm listening. And then not have any doubt that it was God who was talking to you. Now to hear God's voice, you've gotta start with an attitude of submission. You surrender in advance. It's not like tell me Lord and then I'll decide what to do. It's a matter of I've already decided, yes, now just tell me what the, question, what the, what the instructions are. And the best example of this is Moses. Now you can divide Moses' life into three phases, 40, 40, 40. He spent 40 years uh, in the wilderness, in the desert, but before that, he spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court, learning to be a somebody. Then he spent 40 years in the desert, learning to be a nobody. And then he spent the final 40 years of his life being God's somebody. And the episode I want us to look at for just a second happens two thirds through his life. Moses is 80 years old. It's at the end of the 40 years in the desert. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter four, then the Lord, this is when he's at the burning bush, says to Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses says, it's a staff. That, by the way, is the second most important question in life. What's in your hand? The first big question in life is, what have you done with my son, Jesus Christ? I hope you know the answer to that one. But the second most important is, what is in your hand? Now, let's do this picture. Moses is out in the wilderness and he's tending sheep. And one day he sees this burning bush and he walks up to it and the voice comes out of the burning bush, says, Moses, this is holy ground. Take off your shoes. So Moses takes off his shoes. And then God says to Moses, what is in your hand? Well, it's a staff, it's just a shepherd's staff, it's just an old stick. God says, throw it down. And he throws it down and it becomes a what? A snake, a serpent. Something that was dead comes alive. And then he says, pick it up. So Charlton Heston leans over. <laughs> oh, you saw that movie. And he picks it up. And once he picks up the snake, it becomes what? A stick again. It just dies. Now, is that not the strangest story you've ever heard? God says, what do you got? A stick. Throw it down, it becomes a snake. Pick it up, it becomes a stick again. What is that all about? That's like one of the strangest stories in the scripture. Well, I know a couple things. I know one, number one, God never does a miracle to show off. Uh, God doesn't say, hey, I just learned this new trick at the Magic Castle, it's really cool, you can really dazzle friends with it at the next cocktail party. Watch this, throw the stick down, it becomes a snake, pick it up, it becomes a stick again. Wow, that'll be really cool, everybody will love that. God never does a miracle to show off. He's always trying to teach a lesson. Every miracle is a parable and every parable is a miracle. It's a miracle of divine truth. It's what he wants to teach him. The second thing I know about this is when God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. When God asks you a question, he wants you to know the answer. God knew what was in Moses, he knew a thousand years before Moses was born what would be in his hand. When God says, what's in your hand, he's going, 
do you recognize what's in your hand? Now, the key to this whole story is understanding the symbolism of the staff. Because the staff represents three things in Moses' life. His identity, his income, and his influence. First, the staff represents Moses' identity. It represents who he is. Every, um, every occupation has its own symbol. If I wear a stethoscope around my neck, you figure I'm a doctor. If I've got on a white coat, it means I'm, uh, I'm a, a technician or a lab technician or a scientist. The shepherd's staff, you know, it's a staff with a little crook at the end of it, is a symbol of what Moses was. He was a shepherd. It was a symbol of who he was. The shepherd's staff is the symbol of a shepherd. Second, it's not only a symbol of his identity, it's a symbol of his income. Because in those days, you could tell a person's wealth by how many animals they had. All your wealth was stored in livestock. You didn't have stocks and bonds and banking accounts and savings certificates. And so it was really easy to find out how wealthy a person was. If you got a lot of animals, you're rich. If you got a few animals, you're, you're okay. If you have no animals, you're poor. And so the, the flock, the shepherd's staff, represents not only his identity, but his income. He made his living tending sheep. And all of his assets were tied up in his flocks. That's why in the book of Proverbs it says, know well the condition of your flocks. A modern translation that would be, know your business interests well. Today, instead of saying know the condition of your flocks, God would say know the condition of your stocks and your bonds. But in those days, your, your livelihood was tied up in animals. So it represents not only his identity, it represents his income, how much money he had, his wealth, his source of provision in his life. And then the third thing it represents is it represents his influence. What do you use a staff for if you're a shepherd? You move them, use it to move sheep from point A to point B. You either pull them or you poke them, by hook or by crook. And you move people, you move sheep with a shepherd's staff. It represents his influence. And God is saying to Moses, I want you to lay down your identity and your income and your influence and I want you to give it to me. And if you give it to me, I will make it come alive. I'll do a miracle with it if you give it to me, if you lay it down. But every time you pick it up and you take it back, it's gonna die. It just goes back to a dirty, old, dead stick. God is saying this to you today. What is in your hand? What's your identity? What's your income? What's your influence? However great or small it is, God is saying, do you know what I've put in your hand? And if you lay it down, I will make it come alive. But every time you take it back, it's going to die. Now, this simple little story, I suggest to you, is one of the most important stories in history because if this had not happened, there would be no Exodus, there would be no Ten Commandments, there would be no nation of Israel, there would be no Messiah, there would be no death on the cross then, and there would be no church, and we wouldn't be sitting here today if Moses hadn't done that. It's a pivotal point in history. What is in your hand? And he lays it down, and God says, I will make it come alive, and I will do miracles. Now it is interesting that after this happens, in Exodus three and four, Never again in the Bible is it called Moses' staff. 
From this point on, every time this stick is mentioned in scripture, it is no longer called Moses' staff, it is called the rod of God. And it is the rod of God that God uses to do all the miracles in the Exodus. He does all the 10 plagues through the rod of God. uh, Moses takes the rod, dips it in the Nile River and it turns red as blood. He holds up the rod of God at the Red Sea and it splits. He takes the rod of God and he hits the rock at Mara and water comes out to feed a million thirsty Jews. Every single miracle from that point on was done through the rod of God. What is in your hand? And if I don't get anything else done or any more of this message completed, I would say to you, you need to take your identity, your influence, and your income, and you need to lay it down. And God says, if you do, I will make it come alive. And I could tell you a thousand personal stories about that. But it starts, hearing the voice of God starts with the example of Moses being willing to submit, to surrender, to yield, to give up his identity, his influence, and his income for the global glory of God. When you do that, now you are in a position to hear God speak. And God spoke to Moses face to face. Now I want you to write down a couple things. Here are a couple prerequisites for hearing God. Number one, I must believe that God cares about the details of my life. I must believe that God cares about the details of my life. The Bible tells us in Matthew 10, 30, God knows even the hairs on your head. He's got them all counted. Now for some of you, that's not too hard. God knows every hair on your head and the original color. (laughs) And how many fell out in the sink this morning. God is ODing on details in your life. There's nothing in your life that God doesn't know. And so before you can realize that God wants to speak to you, you gotta realize that God cares about every detail of your life. There's no detail he does not care about. Why? Because the Bible says God is love. It doesn't say God has love, it says God is love. It is the essence of his nature, it is his character, it is who God is. Everything in the universe was created for God to love. God is a God of love. If you weren't created in God's image, and if God was not a God of love, there would be no love in your life. The only reason you have the ability to receive love and give love is because you have a creator who loves. God thought up love You were created to be loved by God. You want to know why your heart is beating right now? You want to know why you're breathing this next breath? God made you to love you. He made you to love you. And God's love is unlike anybody else's love because it's unconditional. Because it's not based on what you do, it's based on who he is. It's not based on your conduct, it is based on his character. God will never love you any more than he does this very moment right now. God will never love you any less than he does in this moment right now. God loves you on your good days and your bad days. He loves you when you think you deserve it, when you think you don't deserve it. He loves you when you feel it, and he loves you when you don't feel it. You can't make God stop loving you. You can try, but you will fail. Because God's love is not based on your behavior, it's based on who he is. So the first thing I must realize, if I wanna hear God speak, speak Lord, I'm listening, is I gotta believe that God's interested in the details of my life because he loves me and love pays attention. Well, I'll just throw this one in. Dads, I have dads tell me all the time, I don't understand what my wife and kids want. I give them everything they want. You know what they want? They want you. They want your attention. Attention is the greatest gift you can give somebody because you're saying, I value you. I'm willing to give you my time. I'm giving you willing my attention, my eyes. I believe that God cares about every detail of my life. And the other prerequisite for hearing God is I must believe that God wants to answer my questions, my confusions, 
my quandaries, my problems, that God wants to answer. I have to believe that. James 1, 5 and 6. If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. And he'll gladly tell you, for he's always ready to give wisdom to those who ask him. And he won't resent it. But when you ask, be sure that you expect him to tell you. You have to ask in faith, not in doubt. God is not playing games with your life. Some of you think God is trying to hide his will from you. I talked to somebody between the breaks yesterday. I said, how are you doing? He goes, I just don't know what God wants me to do. And he thinks that maybe God is maybe hiding it from him. God doesn't play games with his will. The Bible says you have not because what? You ask not. Over 20 times in the New Testament, we are commanded to ask. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Over and over and over, we're commanded to ask. God never shuts his storehouse till you shut your mouth. You have not because you ask not. You must believe that God wants to answer your questions. God is more willing to talk to you than you are willing to listen. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. And one of the keys is you must be specific. And I've learned this, that the more specific my question is to God, and I often do this at night. Often, when I get ready to go to bed, I ask God a question. Lord, and I'll ask this question about my life, my ministry, my family, whatever, and then I go to sleep and I let the Holy Spirit work on my subconscious. And more times than not, I've awakened with a solution. Why, because I was relaxed and God could speak to my heart. So how do you receive guidance from God? How do you hear the voice of God? Well, the model, or at least one of the models, is in a little known book at the end of the New Old Testament. It's called the book of Habakkuk. Now I, as a pastor, like to always teach my people these little books because, and I'm teaching this to you today because when you get to heaven, I don't want you to be embarrassed. I don't want Habakkuk come up to me, come up to you and say, hey, how'd you like my book? And you go, oh, oh, Mr. Habakkuk, I didn't even know you were in the Bible. That would be embarrassing. So pastors, there are major truths in the minor prophets, and you need to study those. In Habakkuk, we find the model for hearing the voice of God. And in chapter one of Habakkuk, Habakkuk asks God six questions, very specific questions. And in chapter two, he gets a very specific answer. Let me read it to you. Habakkuk chapter two, verses one and two. These are the five things you do to hear the voice of God. I will climb up in my watchtower and I will wait. And I will look to see what the Lord will say. Then the Lord gave me this answer. Write down what I reveal to you so that you can read it at a glance. Now Habakkuk models the five steps of hearing the voice of God. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Okay, write these down. Here's step number one. If you want to hear the voice of God in your life, And these will become second nature to you when you get to be as old as I do if you practice it all your life. Number one is withdraw. Withdraw. In other words, I pull back, I get alone with God in a quiet place. Habakkuk says, I will climb into my watchtower. That's a Hebrew expression that means just getting alone. You can't hear God's voice if you've got your earbuds in if you're always listening to something else, if you're always surrounded by noise. The Bible tells us that Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. Often means it's a habit. Do you have that habit? Some of you can't stand to be alone. It scares you, it freaks you out, it makes you nervous. You can last in silence about three seconds. Then you gotta turn on your MP3 player or whatever. What you gotta do is withdraw, you gotta remove every distraction as possible. I withdraw, get alone, I will climb my watchtower. Number two, you wait. You withdraw, then you wait. He says, um, I will wait. So what does that mean? That means I calm my thoughts and I calm my emotions. NIV translation says I will station myself. What does it mean station? It means you don't move. 
You be still, you calm down. Hurry is the death of prayer. God, I need you to talk to me, but you need to tell me really quick, because I'm in a hurry. I'm going to Starbucks. <laughs> then you're not gonna hear God. God speaks to those who wait on him. You gotta withdraw, and you gotta wait. God speaks to those who take the time to listen. And, he, and, and in that waiting period, what you do is you calm your body, and you calm your mind, and you calm your emotions. Now, how do you do that? You do it the way David did. David shows us how to do this in scripture. The first thing you do is you relax your body. Psalm 46, David says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. Modern translation, Rick Warren translation, sit down and shut up. <laughs> be still. Everybody right now just take a deep breath and let it out. And then you just kind of move your muscles a little bit and you just kind of you know, shake it out and you just relax. And, and you just be quiet and you let go of tension and you get comfortable. The Bible says David sat before the Lord. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't kneel in prayer very much. Why? It hurts. <laughs> and when I'm in pain, I can't hear the voice of God. I hear God much easier in my lazy boy chair. <laughs> or prone, which is my favorite position. Uh, so you relax your body and then you just sit in silence. Psalm 62 verse five says, my soul waits in silence for God. Until you get comfortable with silence, you will never, never, never hear the voice of God. Until you get comfortable with silence. Now, you just be quiet. I say it like this. Inner calm gives me the inner calm to God. Inner calm creates the inner calm, the channel to hearing the voice of God. And if you don't hear the voice of God, you're just hoping for the best in life. As I said, almost everything I've done in life, I just move when God says move, and I wait when God says wait, and I go slow when God says slow, and I run when God says run, and I just listen to the voice of God. It's not that hard once you learn how to do it. You withdraw, and you wait, and you relax your body, and you sit in silence. You cannot force this, it takes time. Number three, the third thing Habakkuk does is he says, I will look to see what the Lord will say. Here's the third thing he does. Read the word of God. I will look to see what the Lord will say. Now, that doesn't even sound right, does it? Why does it say look to see what God says? It makes more sense to say listen to hear what God says. But it doesn't say listen to hear what God says. It says look to see what God says. God's will is found in God's word. It's found right here in, in, in the word of God. It's all right there. God will never contradict his word. Now I want you to write this down. Stop waiting for a voice and start looking for a verse. That was worth the price of the conference. You can go home now. Okay. Stop waiting for a voice, some sign in the sky and start looking for a verse. God has already said an awful lot right here. And you look for it. Now, but I wanna add to this also, when he says, I will look to see what God will say, because God often speaks to us in mental pictures. He does this hundreds of times in scripture. And he speaks to us in a visual that you get in your mind. So a lot of times as I'm just sitting outside in the morning, alone with God, and I'll say, Jesus, is there anything you wanna to say to me? And I'll just wait, and I'll worship, and I'll read, and I'll wait some more, and I'll be quiet. And sometimes he says, no, everything's fine. And sometimes I go, you need to work on this. But about 80% of the stuff God says to me is just encouragement. I had a lady in my church one time, every week after church, she'd come up to me and she said, God just convicted me of, and then 
the next week, God just really got me on, and then the next week, God just criticized me for, and on. And finally, after about six months, I said, like, ma'am, does God ever say anything nice to you? I don't think you're t- dialed into the same God I know. Because it's always, I think you are projecting on God. Step number four, I, I withdraw to a secret place. I wait and I calm my thoughts and emotion. And then I read, I will look to see what the Lord will say. And then step four, I write. I write down the insights I receive. And Habakkuk, this is the fourth thing, he says, then the Lord gave me the answer, write down what I reveal to you. In chapter one, Habakkuk writes down what he said to God, and in chapter two, he writes down what God says back to him. Is it okay to write down your prayers and read them to God? Uh, duh, they're called the book of Psalms. Uh, so that's how we got a lot of the Bible. Okay, and then finally, five, and I'm gonna ask Pastor Brian to come up on stage now, and we're gonna set up a couple chairs here. Finally, the fifth thing is review. I review regularly what God has taught me. And I, he says, write down what I reveal to you so you can read it at a glance. Now, why should you write down the impressions that God gives to you in your time and quiet time? Because one of the things you need to do is test them. You need to test them. And I asked Pastor Brian last night, I said, you know what, I, I'd like to invite you up and let's just spend the last nine or 10 minutes talking about how to test an impression. How do you know if an idea came from God, or how do you know if it came from the devil, or how do you know that it came from the bad burrito you ate last night? (laughs) Which I've had many false impressions from bad burritos. (laughs) But the Bible says uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light, and the Bible says that you can fool yourself. So how do you know? Now, let's set these chairs up here and, and I wanna just ask Brian, first thing, why did you choose this theme, speak Lord, I'm listening, and, and what does that mean to you? Let's welcome Pastor Brian back. Thanks, buddy. Let's thank Pastor Rick for great instruction so far. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I want, I'm gonna give a list of Six ways to test an impression. You might write these down. And we're just gonna, we've only got about eight minutes left, so we've got about a minute on each one. I'll mention the, the concept, and Brian, if you want to comment on any of them. Okay. okay? So, first test. How do you test if an idea is from God? Number one, is it consistent with the Bible? The Bible says in uh, Luke, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will pass away. The Bible says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. It's gotta line up with the word. (laughs) Well, I can tell you a terrible example of someone doing that badly. Hmm. Many, many years ago, we were speaking to someone who, uh, he had had 11 children, Uh and uh, he, uh, you know, was obviously happily married. Well, we thought happily married. Anyway, he had an affair. Yeah. And so when we confronted him, yeah. this part of the church, when we, not our church, this is before Hillsong, yeah. but yeah. when we confronted him, he said, no, God spoke to me and said, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. I said, well, what did God say? He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> 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 so I guess it has to line up with yeah. the whole tenor of scripture, yeah, 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 yeah. not yeah. a random yeah. verse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's like the guy who was trying to do the get, dip and skip method. He said, Lord, show me your will today. And he opened up the Bible and he put his finger down on the verse and it said, Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> and he thought that couldn't be right. So he flips it around again and he puts his finger down and Jesus said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> that's the kind of result if you do this cafeteria dip and skip style. So don't do that. Okay, question number two. Are you ready for test? We're, we're running through these. I could give you an hour on each one, but test number two, will it make me more like Christ? That's the second test of an impression. Second Corinthians 10, five, we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Christ is the ultimate standard, and so if it's gonna make you more like Christ, it's likely to come from God. Talk, you wanna talk about that? Well, all I would say is that um, 
firstly, I think it's a great, it's a great uh, test mm -hmm. because uh, if, if it's not taking us closer to Jesus and closer to the will of God, then mm -hmm. I think that should be fairly clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, test number three. Here's a big one. Does my church family confirm it? Does my church family confirm? Ephesians 3.10 says God's intent was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. The Christian life is more than just believing, it's also belonging and you're part of a family. And by the way, if you're reading through scripture and you get an interpretation that nobody else in 2,000 years of Christianity has ever had, guess what? You're wrong. <laughs> because God speaks to his body. If it's true, it's not new. Truth has always been eternal. Truth is never invented. Truth is rediscovered. But if it's true, it's not new. It's been around forever. You know, I think the church family part is critical mm. because you'll always find someone to tell you what you want to hear. Mm. In the Old Testament, King Ahab, mm. he went to 400 different prophets asking whether he should go to war. Yeah, yeah. And well, all of them to told him what he wanted to hear. Yeah. Because, and especially sometimes people who have some form of influence, there'll be yeah. always people around you yeah. who'll tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. And then the prophet says, is there any others? He said, well, there's just one, but I hate him. <laughs> That's literally what the Bible says. He yeah, said, I yeah, hate yeah, him. Yeah. Because there was one prophet, 400 told him what he wanted to hear, but only one who told him what he needed to hear. Yeah. And uh, you so, know, I mean, your hairdresser will tell you, but yeah. there'll be all sorts of people. So exactly. the right people around you, church, family, Godly counsel is absolutely critical. Did you hear what he just said? That's so important. If mature believers have a check on something you feel is an impression from God, you really ought to check it out. Okay, when in doubt, check it out. Okay, when in doubt, check it out. Go to some godly believers. The Bible says the wisdom of the righteous can save you. And by the way, if you get an idea and you feel any personal resistance to sharing it with anybody else to have it checked, where do you think that resistance is coming from? It's not coming from God, okay? It's coming from Satan, okay? Number four, test four, how to test an impression. Is it consistent with how God shaped me? Is it consistent with how God shaped me? Ephesians 2.10, God made us what we are and in Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works which he planned in advance for us to do. You can discover a lot about God's will but for your life by looking at how God wired you. I know that it is not God's will for me to be an opera singer. Because <laughs> I can't carry a tune in a baggie on that. And, and so I know, if, if I got an impression God wants you to resign as a pastor, become an airline pilot, I would know it would not be God's will. Because I'm not shaped for that. It's, it's who you are, it's how, how you're wired. And so if you're tone deaf, God is not calling you to be a worship leader. Sorry. You wanna say anything about that? Well, I think God's not schizophrenic. <laughs> he doesn't make you one way to use yeah. you a different way. A good point. He knew exactly what he had in mind when he created you and gave you all those gifts and talents. Yeah, good point. And that's what Ephesians says. You look at your shape. And by the way, I, you know, I wrote a chapter on this in Purpose Driven Life, the five things that make you you, S-H-A-P-E. Spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personalities, and experiences. And the kind of experience that God uses most to shape you, hate to tell you this, it's painful. Painful experiences. Your greatest ministry will come out of your deepest hurt. Who could better help a person who's been raped than somebody who's been raped? Anybody can bring good out of good. God specializes in bringing good out of bad. He loves to turn crucifixions into resurrections. Okay, we got two minutes left. One minute, 54 seconds. Number five, fifth way to test an impression. Is it convicting rather than condemning? Now, let me, let me just say what I'm talking about here. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But the Bible also says in Revelation, Satan is the accuser. So how do you know when it's conviction? How do you know when it's condemnation? Conviction comes from God. Condemnation comes from the devil. Conviction is because God loves you. Condemnation comes because Satan hates you. Conviction says you're a sinner. Condemnation says you're worthless. Before I say anything else, you are not worthless. Okay, you're not worthless. Um, if you want to know how valuable you are, you look at the cross. 
With arms outstretched and nail-pierced hands, Jesus says, I love you this much. I love you so much it hurts. And with dro blood dropping from his hands, he says, I'd rather die than live without you. That's how much you value. That's how much God values you. You know what? Let me give you one more. I'm gonna skip you on this because there's one more test and then I'm gonna tell you a story about that one. Uh, I didn't plan on doing it. The sixth question is, do, does, do I sense God's peace about it? And, and the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. If you feel pressured, if you feel overwhelmed, we don't have any example in scripture of Jesus running anywhere. He was never in a hurry. So the, the, the Holy Spirit draws you gently the whole, the, Satan drives you fiercely. You wanna say a word about that, about peace of God? I think um, the peace of God, it's lasting as well. Like you can have an impression, um, but it's really, you know, does it sustain the test, that impression? Does it stay strong? And I think that's where often the peace of God comes into it. Mm -hmm. I'll end with a story. I, um, a while back I was speaking at a prison, 6,000 prisoners, uh, we had had uh, uh, them go through 40 days of purpose and 189 guys had gone through 40 days of purpose and about 87 of them accepted Christ and I went up there to baptize them in the, in the yard and there were 6,000 guys in the yard and they gave me an hour and a half to preach to them and uh, they, nobody was paying attention. I had a microphone but nobody was paying attention. So I pulled out a $50 bill and I held it up say, anybody want this $50 bill? 6,000 hands went up. I took it and I crumpled it up and I tore it a little bit. I said, anybody want this $50 bill? 6,000 hands still went up. I spit on that $50 bill and I put it on the ground and I stomped it into the ground. I said, anybody want this $50 bill? 6,000 hands went, went up. And I said, guys, some of you, this is what your daddy did to you and what society did to you and you were told that you were worthless you didn't amount to anything and you're broken and you're bruised and you're dirtied and you've been spit on and you did some stupid stuff and that's why you're here too but you have not lost one cent of your value to God did you enjoy that I wanted you to hear that message. Let's bow our heads. Why don't you just say this to God in your heart? God, forgive me for the times I've been so busy I couldn't hear you. Forgive me for the distractions and the noises and the voices that I've listened to instead of you. Help me to do what Habakkuk did. Help me to withdraw to a quiet place this week. And help me to wait and to be still and to listen, to calm my body and my emotions and to relax and just open up and listen to you and to sit in silence. And help me to read your word, to look for a verse rather than listen and wait for a voice. Help me to write down what you say to me so that I can review it and actually remember it and practice it. God, I wanna hear from you this week. And I humbly ask this in Jesus' name, amen.